Investment Act number 14 of 2015, section 24.1, provides that not later than three months after the end of each financial year, and in accordance with subsection 3, the board shall submit to the minister an annual report on the work and activities of the board for that financial year, and the minister shall not later than three months after the submission lead the same in Parliament. And Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said and asked for this report, and I'm sure you would share with me the view that the leader of the opposition, who is the main person calling for the report, would have made sure that he's in this honorable house to at least listen to the minister's statement that addresses that report and other matters relating to the CIP. But I'm sure as soon as I'm finished, he will come and join the chamber. But that notwithstanding, Mr. Speaker, what this means is that this report is one year late, for which I sincerely apologize. We should always endeavor at all times to meet our statutory obligations. I do not desire to see this as a routine practice. And I believe that unlike what has become a norm with so many statutory bodies, we should always endeavor to meet our statutory obligations. I have been informed that the delay was due to a number of factors, some of which were beyond the control of the unit. But it is not a time to give reasons or excuses. Better must be done by the unit. I am also informed that every effort is being made by the auditors so that the unit can present to me the annual report for 2023-2024, which is statutorily due to be laid in this house on 31st October 2024. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, we are now at this point only laid with one report which has been laid today. I will endeavor, Mr. Speaker, to have this report submitted to Parliament as soon as possible after I have received it. The 2022-2023 report shows, one, 85% increase in applications received from 583 to 1,076. 25% increase in applications granted from 445 to 544. 35.58 million dollars or 94 percent increase in total assets in comparison to 2022. Growth in shareholders equity to 37.7 million dollars or 44 percent versus prior ending March 2022. Five, 12 percent growth in revenue from 54.2 million to 60.6 million dollars. Six, 40% increase in staff, bolstering the capacity of the due diligence, verification, and accounts departments. There were, of course, Mr. Speaker, challenges faced by the unit. One, delay in the clearance of funds at the banks affecting processing start times. And two, limited workspace to accommodate the growth in personnel. Three, 43% or $10.1 million increase in program costs, driven by a 948% increase in marketing agent commissions, having resulted in a reduction in surplus from 27.7 million in 2022 to 22.8 million in 2023. Coming off a 44% increase in applications in the previous year, the unit registered another strong performance with an 85% increase in applications compared to the year ending March 2022. This increase in applications was fueled by Galaxy's sale of shares in its canal development and targeted marketing efforts in emerging regions, including parts of the Middle East and West Africa. There was a heavy investment in human capital with the recruitment of skilled personnel in the areas of due diligence, finance, and broader compliance. The year was not without its shortcomings. The unit, which usually processes applications within 90 days, saw an increase in the application processing times. 
Not all factors contributing to this were internal. The due diligence processes were enhanced, resulting in increased waiting for feedback. In addition, our key partners, the banks, NIC, Immigration Department, also had to increase their resource allocation to deal with the increasing demand for their services. The unit continues to be in a strong cash position, boosting an impressive balance sheet with a growth in shareholders' equity by 44% of $37.7 million. The delays in the application time resulted in a delay in the turnover of qualifying investment payments. Despite this, the unit still ended the year with a $22.8 million surplus. I look forward to comments from the public on the report. Beyond the tabling of the report, the CIP has been the subject of much discussion, misinformation, disinformation, political showboating, and maliciousness. Some will even say that the intense focus on the CIP has exposed those whose relentless pursuit of power knows no bounds. So, Mr. Speaker, today I will take the opportunity to address a number of concerns, provide information to those who genuinely demand and expect governmental accountability, and expose some of the deceit. I would wish to start with the RICO case filed by Felipe Martinez. In my address on 12 June 2024, I explained the origins of this RICO case. As indicated, we did not know Martinez or have any dealings with him. Martinez filed this RICO case against Galaxy and its CEO, two former prime ministers of St. Kitts. The St. Kitts National Bank is St. Kitts escrow agent, and he threw in McLeod Emanuel, the CEO of our CIP, with no basis whatsoever. Martinez has never invested in St. Lucia and has nothing to do with our CIP. He has a grievance with St. Kitts that had nothing to do with St. Lucia, yet he has added McLeod Emanuel to this case. He claims that Mr. Emanuel had knowledge of galaxies underselling in St. Lucia and failed to stop it. All of the defendants are applying to dismiss this RICO case all of them, and the judge has asked for the motions to be jointly filed on the 1st of November 2024. Since the filing of the civil RICO case in June 2024, a civil case, and not a criminal matter by the U.S. authorities or law enforcement agency, as the opposition is saying, Martinez has called into our local talk shows, attended DBS interviews, and together with Kenneth Rijok and the leader of the opposition, the member for Miku South, has launched a vicious attack on me as minister for the CIP. He has launched an attack on Galaxy, a developer he introduced to St. Lucia and encouraged to invest and undertake a CIP project, and he deemed them an approved developer. He has also launched the attack on upstanding lawyers who are authorized agents because they process applications in relation to the Galaxy project and also attack employees of the CIP unit for simply doing their jobs and in one case for simply being the daughter of our Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the processes and procedures in place at the unit are the same as when the UWP was in government. The same except we immediately discontinued the use of the Chinese due diligence firm they were using to review applications for citizenships. Reflect on this. It's the same. Except that they were using a Chinese due diligence firm, which we stopped immediately. It was they who were using the Chinese due diligence firm. When the leader of the opposition attacks me and the CIP program, He's actually attacking a program he maintained for five years and a program which brings significant revenue to our country. The processes undertaken by our CIP unit 
to verify an applicant for citizenship and to ensure the legal requirements for citizenships are met before being issued a certificate of registration are just the same and are maintained and undertaken at the highest level of integrity. Anyone who seeks to state otherwise is only seeking to destroy our CIP and indeed our country. Mr. Speaker, the UWP government introduced Galaxy to St. Lucia and gave them their first allocation of citizenships for the construction of the resort at Carnell's. I spoke, out, I spoke out against Galaxy during my time in opposition, as Galaxy was selling citizenships and there had been no construction or activity, and they had not completed their development in St. Kitts. The member for Miku South at that time stated that he was satisfied with Galaxy and had sent a team to St. Kitts to assess these claims. The lawyer who was representing Galaxy and processing applications for Galaxy was the leader of the opposition, personal lawyer. There were claims, there were claims as far back then that Galaxy was offering financing and discounting sales, the so-called underselling. The honorable member for Miku South stated that these claims were investigated and it was determined that nothing wrong was being done and that there were procedures to ensure that all our requirements were met. The former prime minister gave a resounding endorsement of Galaxy, including assisting them in securing the hotel management contract with AM Resorts. Galaxy also received a strong endorsement from the former Minister of, Com of Commerce. Here is, here is the endorsement of the opposition from the member from Suzel Saltibus when in government. And I quote, Caribbean Galaxy Real Estate is a citizenship by investment client. And they were screened through rigorous processes. CIP ensured that the company met all requirements of transparency and had a proven track record of doing ethical business throughout the region and internationally as well. Do you want me to repeat it, Mr. Speaker? Let me repeat it. No. And I quote, Caribbean Galaxy Real Estate is a citizenship by investment client and they were screened through rigorous processes. CIP ensured that the company met all requirements of transparency and had a proven track record of doing ethical business throughout the region and internationally as well. Yet, when it was convenient to join Martinez to destroy our country, our future, our children's future, he changed his tune. This is a poor reflection on our country. How can we encourage developers to invest in St. Lucia and turn around and attack them simply because it is politically expedient to do so? This needs to stop. And the time will come when it will stop. When the leader of the opposition was chastised by right-thinking St. Lucians for his attacks, the member for Miku South stated, and listen to this one, he would bring Martinez, he would visit Martinez and bring back evidence. We are still waiting for the evidence. He has since claimed it would be emailed to him. We are still waiting for the email. Instead, each week, we are promised a bombshell of untold proportions bombshells that will destroy the reputation of our country. Mr. Speaker, spare me to focus on the escrow arrangements. And I really want on all, all honorable members to listen to this one carefully. There is no Ill illegality in the issuance of citizenship applications or in the processes undertaken by the CIP in relation to the Galaxy Project or any other CIP project. 
In St. Lucia, since this government came into office in July 2021, when Galaxy became an approved developer, when Galaxy became an approved developer in St. Lucia in 2019, under the former administration, they agreed to construct the Canals project. An escrow agent was approved by the board on 21st August 2019, pursuant to approved guidelines for the establishment and maintenance of an irrevocable escrow account, which includes, among other things, the obligation to hold the proceeds of the said escrow account in trust for Galaxy. In trust for Galaxy. August 2019. In trust for Galaxy and the investor, that is the applicant for citizenship, pursuant to an escrow agreement approved by the board. The guidelines also provided for the escrow account to remit monthly bank statements of the revenue and expenditure of the escrow account to the unit. The escrow account does not hold the money in trust for the government of St. Lucia. It is not our money. It is Galaxy's money from the sale of shares in their development. The money is to be used for the construction of the resort and the developer's expenses. The guidelines expressly state that the escrow agent must hold the money for and on behalf of the developer and the investor and shall release, transfer, or otherwise deal with the escrow funds solely as directed in accordance with the terms of the escrow agreement. The government of St. Lucia is not a party to the escrow agreement, as set up by the leader of the opposition when he was, he was minister. The escrow account, the escrow agreement, is between the developer, the investor, and the escrow agent. These guidelines, practices, and arrangements were all in place since 2019. Under the former administration, we have not changed this. The unit undertakes a rigorous due diligence process in relation to each applicant with reputable due diligence firms from the United States of America and the United Kingdom who review the applications and their back, the applicants and their backgrounds. The due diligence on the applicant is further undertaken by local enforcement, then by the GRCC, which is an additional layer of due diligence shared by all five Caribbean CBI programs. The GRCC is a sub-agency of the Caribbean Community Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, what you know as IMPACTS. No individual, employee, or person of the unit can ever influence the approval granted by these agencies. No one. The statements made by Martinez, Rejok, and the UWP that the Prime Minister's daughter has any influence on this process is completely false. The applicant, also once approved, will pay due diligence fees, will pay due diligence fees, sorry, to the bank account of the unit. The applicant submits the application for citizenship through their authorized agent, which in most cases is a lawyer. The same lawyers, Martinez, the UWP, and Kenneth Rejok have sought to vilify for simply doing their job. The due diligence is undertaken, and once an applicant has been approved by all of these agencies, the escrow agent is asked to provide proof that the minimum investment amount has been paid by the applicant in the escrow account. And the authorized agent is to produce, to provide the oath of allegiance duly signed by the applicant. On receipt of the confirmation that the minimum investment amount has been paid to the escrow account, government fees are received. Interviews, interviews carried out and the oath duly executed. Only then, the applicant is approved for citizenship and the certificate of registration submitted to the minister for execution. So there's a completely process that must be followed by each applicant. This is the same process undertaken when the member for Miku South was minister responsible for the CIP, except 
the applicants are now required to do interviews, which they were not required to do previously. The only change, we have strengthened the due diligence. We now interview the applicants. The escrow agent remains the same. The guidelines remain the same. And the escrow agreement, the escrow agent has not changed. The guidelines remain the same and the escrow agreement have not changed. The change is that we do more due diligence. The suggestion that illegal passports have been granted because the minimum investment amount was not paid is false, totally false. The suggestion that any passport should be revoked because they were granted illegally is false. We are not privy to the commercial arrangements between an investor, applicant, and a developer. But what we do know is that the applicant pays the minimum investment amount into the escrow account before citizenship is granted to the applicant. And that applicant would have been approved by the due diligence agencies. That's very clear. As I would have explained before, the escrow agent approved by the former administration is to provide monthly statements. That person has not changed. Provide monthly statements to the unit. It is important to note that the unit reviews and reconciles these statements and confirms that the minimum investment amount was in fact paid into the escrow account and the particulars of the transfer is stated. Due diligence fees and government fees are paid by the applicant to the bank account of the unit held at a bank in St. Lucia. The bank in St. Lucia charges fees to undertake its own due diligence in relation to these incoming funds. And these funds are only cleared when the due diligence of the bank is satisfactorily complete so there's a process in the unit, and there's a process in the bank. The allegation that the bank partakes in any money laundering and is complicit in any illegality is false. This attack on our banking system and our citizens is unwarranted and only seeks to destroy the credibility and integrity of our institutions and our people. The member for Miku South knows that the money is the money of the developer. This is the process he approved as Minister for the CIP and approved by the board under his watch. I want to repeat that. This is the process that he approved as Minister for the CIP and approved by the board under his watch. Despite all of this, Mr. Speaker, the member for Miku South contends that he will bring an action to revoke passports and has stated that he will ask Martinez to pay for lawyers to take St. Lucia to court. I quote the former Prime Minister. Now, and I quote, now I believe that we should write Mr. Martinez and to say to him that if in fact the government does not want to join, the people of St. Lucia will join. And so I'm going to ask my party at its next meeting to approve the beginning of a petition in St. Lucia that we accumulate as many names as possible to send it to Mr. Martinez and to tell him that we want our money back. The same money he knows that's not our money. And to ask him whether he will pay the legal fees to assist us in going after our money and to make sure our money comes back from China here to St. Lucia. Who made arrangements for our money to go to China in the first place? But, but it is not our money, it's the developer's money. You know. A former prime minister a member of the House seeking to finance action against his country, knowing full well that he set up a process 
which provides for Galaxy to retain the investments to construct the resort. He did it. This is a hostile act against the government and people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, I go on. I have heard the false narrative that we have collected over 1.4 billion US dollars and that I have stolen the money. Another version is that Galaxy has collected the monies and I'm benefiting from it. It is a daily story posted and circulated. None of this is true. If they know how to steal $1.4 billion, that's them. We don't engage in theft of public funds or any funds. And no amounting or manufacturing or repeating lies and false narratives can ever make it true. There's been much ado about the number of shares granted to Galaxy by this government. Shares are approved for a CIP project and permits investors who purchase shares from the developer to apply for citizenship. In November 2021, I met with Galaxy and informed them that they are required by law to construct the resort. We insisted that the resort must be built. Galaxy agreed that once they finished selling shares for their project in St. Kitts, they would move their operations to St. Lucia to commence the resort. They later indicated that after consultations with AM Resorts, the scope of the project had increased significantly, and additionally, due to the increased construction costs after 2019, they would need to revise the agreed number of shares. The number of shares to Galaxy was increased by the board, and construction on the resort began in early 2023. We have noted delays in construction, and it has not been at the pace and stage that we require and I've met with Galaxy to discuss Member the delays. Of South, just hold on. Member of Miku North, Miku South, there is a process in requesting information from members. I would suggest you read the standing orders, acquaint yourself with that process, and not cross-talk the member by asking questions which the standing orders allow you to ask. We, we have... I'm coming to that, I'm coming to that. We have been assured, because you will tell me what you did with the DSH shares. We have been assured that construction will be accelerated and the result will be completed by May 2026. Delays and costs increases in construction has affected almost every project in St. Lucia since COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, if it is that Galaxy was conducting its business illegally, and wrongfully allowed to earn over one billion dollars that belongs to St. Lucia, then the former government, the former Prime Minister, would need to answer a few questions. DSH applied for CIP approval for a project estimated at US $1.8 billion. In their proposal, they requested 9,160 shares. 9,160 shares. Now multiply this by US 300,000 K. That gives $2.7 billion. I am told that the then CEO of the CIP was removed from office because she did not recommend approval of the application. The requirement to allow CIP escrow accounts to be held in St. Lucia was changed by the former administration to accommodate DSH. So it was he that changed the law to allow escrows to be held overseas. But listen to this, Mr. Speaker. There was placed on the CIP website, and it is still there, the announcement and placement of the Alpina St. Lucia Hotel and Alpina Square as two CIP-approved projects. You can visit the website now. Scroll to the bottom and click on Get an Investment Project Approved. You can even see the date that it was announced to the world on the website, January 11th, 2021. January 11th, 2021. Now, does that mean that the 2.7 billion is missing? Does that mean that the former prime minister for the CIP is corrupt and stole the money? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, ask the leader of the opposition about the range development. About the range development. This was approved. This was approved 
as a CIP real estate development, but was then actually sold as a donation option under the former administration. There is no authority, there is no authority on which real estate shares could be sold as donation. And I want to repeat this. I want to repeat this. Range was approved as a CIP real estate option, but it was sold as a donation option under the former administration. There is no authority, no changes in the regulations, no changes in the law that allows real estate to be sold as donation. Under which authority was it done? How many shares were sold? Where was the money deposited? How much money was paid to range in settlement of the claim against the government? Who else were payments made to? Maybe the leader of the opposition can answer these questions. So before he can demand answers to questions, maybe he should start answering a few about Alpina and range. Mr. Speaker, I cannot move on without reflecting on the untold damage has been done to the reputation of a group of lawyers and employees of the CIP unit and the board members by the actions of Martinez, Kenneth Rejok, and the UWP party. You see, when it was thought that Thaddeus Antoine was a beneficiary of the operations of Galaxy, he was accused and maligned as corrupt and as an enabler. All sorts of stories were made up. But then reality strikes. There were several lawyers who are authorized agents doing their job and processing applications for a CIP project approved by the former administration. They now attack and vilify Jeffrey Dubule, who he knows very well, Diana Thomas, Jonathan McNamara, and Brenda Fosak. Articles have been written and statements made about them which are completely and totally unwarranted and unacceptable. There was no wrong committed by these lawyers, and it is unfair for them to be targeted and wrongfully accused. Accomplished professionals having to pay the price of cheap, vindictive politics by the leader of the opposition. They have also attacked and threatened the jobs of employees and threatened members of the board. All of this is unwarranted and needs to stop. In my address of June 12, 2024, I provided details of the number of applications received and approvals given and indicated how many were real estate approvals for Galaxy. Mr. Speaker, I wish to provide an update on these figures. From 1st of August 2021 to 30th August 2024, we have granted 2,873 approvals, of which 1,970, or 69%, were real estate for Galaxy. Let me repeat it, Mr. Speaker, because people will say uh, how many, that 14,000 applications have been given and multiplied. From 1st of August 2021, a few days after we came into office, to 30th August 2024, we have granted 2,873 approvals. 2,873 approvals, of which 1,970, or 69%, were real estate for Galaxy. So Galaxy has only received 1,970 approvals wow. since we came into office. Contrary to what you have heard in publicized interviews and repeated by the member for Miku South and the UWP, St. Lucia has never approved 14,000 applications. I want to uh, repeat, St. Lucia has never approved 14,000 applications and there is no $1.4 billion. We have only approved over 1,970 real estate applications for Galaxy. I must also categorically state that contrary to what has been said, Galaxy has never collected $1.2 billion. Mr. Speaker, I now address the infrastructure option. I have never seen an opposition 
so scared and panic so quickly at the announcement of a government program? Why are they so scared of the apparent success of the CIP and particularly the infrastructure option? The opposition has been raising issue with the so-called infrastructure option and what they claim is corruption. Not that they disagree with an infrastructure option and that they have a brighter idea. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, not that the United Workers Party and the leader of the opposition disagree with an infrastructure option and that they have a brighter idea. Instead, it is just seen as corruption. Under the enterprise option, we added a third sub-option which allows a developer to propose a self-financed project in one of the investment areas in exchange for an agreed number of qualifying applications, similar to shares in the real estate option. The developer has to source the finance and spend upfront and carries all the risk has the responsibility for sourcing the applicants, carries the risk of sale, and even termination of the program, and has to implement the project under the supervision of the government of St. Lucia. Since its announcement, we have been able to secure investment in a national infrastructure improvement project by Caribbean Galaxy, a housing project by BMAX LLC, which I will come to shortly, and we have a pending application for another housing project. The opposition has cried foul. They claim that the option is illegal. They claim it is illegal because it was not gazetted. The changes to provide for this option were gazetted on December 20th, 2023. So how was it not gazetted? How? As per legislation, the opposition could have tabled a resolution in Parliament to oppose the changes. They never did. It meant that it is now legal to offer the option to investors. We were delayed in gazetting the specific projects as approved projects. We believe that this has to be done to inform the public of the projects that have been approved. Once we were aware of the failing, we immediately corrected it. But if not gazetting the specific projects is legal, is illegal, then what of the projects the leader of the opposition did not gazette? It has been brought to our attention that the DSH projects, the range development, and the Galaxy Canals projects were never gazetted. were never gazetted by the former administration. The same persons who are saying we are illegal because we had not gazetted on time. They never gazetted it. But yet, all those projects won the CIP website as approved. What not? We are now presently awaiting guidance from legal counsel as to whether we should proceed to gazette the Canals project. So we may very well now, years later, go and rectify it because they are saying it must be done, but they never did it for no project. So we may still have to gazette the Canals project for you. You see, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this enterprise option has the potential to open significant avenues for investment in constructing roads and highways, upgrading educational institutions, housing, and medical facilities. And I want, Mr. Speaker, for you to listen to this one. No applications have yet been approved under these projects, and they are still going through the due diligence processes. No applications under the infrastructure option has been approved, and they are all still going through the due diligence process. Further, 
No minimum investment amounts have been received by these developers. No minimum investment amounts have been received by these developers. The BMAX housing project commenced in October 2024, and the Galaxy project has not yet commenced, as the Ministry of Infrastructure is in the process of identifying various works and contractors for these projects. Mr. Speaker, BMAX LLC, whom I mentioned earlier, has recently become the subject of discussion in the media, and I think it is important that I explain the position. In 2022, after a roadshow promoting the Citizenship by Investment Program, we received through one of our marketing agents a prospective investor, BMAX LLC, a company incorporated in the United Arab Emirates, represented by Alexandra Mijalovic, who was interested in financing housing and road infrastructure projects. Having been provided with the list of possible areas of investment in, in roads and housing, BMAX submitted a letter of intent dated 22nd November 2022 for the Rock Hall housing development. BMAX visited St. Lucia in December 2022. All background checks and due diligence were undertaken and provided no adverse findings. The project was approved in January 2024, and the developer started the sale of shares to investors in February 2024. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, September 30th, 2024, I was informed that Mr. Alexander Mijadovic had been arrested on February 19, 2024, for alleged involvement in smuggling of cigarettes between 2016 and 2021. This was long after all our background checks and due diligence was done. He was not charged, but put on bail pending further investigations. The CIP unit has a system for continuous monitoring of all St. Lucian's CIP citizens but Alexander Mijalovic is not a citizen and would not have shown up on any notification. Immediately upon receiving such information, the unit sought to obtain as much information as possible, as much information as possible, to understand what had transpired, in including asking the individual involved to submit a signed statement duly notarized explaining the circumstances of his arrest and questioning. A statement was received by the unit. The following was explained, that he is innocent. Two, that he is a victim of political persecution. He stated that he owns business interests in Montenegro, including media interests. He is well known as a supporter and donor of the now opposition party, which lost parliamentary elections in June 2023. He indicated that once he was arrested, he transferred all his shares in his various businesses to other investors. Therefore, he holds no longer, therefore, he no longer holds any interest in the company undertaking the housing project. He stated, number four, that according to Montenegro law, not leader of the opposition law, according to Montenegro law, the prosecution has six months to indict and charge him. The six months expired on August 19, 2024. The persecution requested an extension of two months to complete the investigations. The two months expired on October 19, 2024. He has not been charged. We are presently awaiting further information from various sources on the situation and will take legal advice on the options open to the government of St. Lucia on how we proceed in relation to this developer and this project. Meanwhile, we are conducting due diligence on the new owner of BMAX, Veslin Kovacevic. I will provide updates as they become available. But let me assure St. Lucians and the constituents of Kasuis is of one thing. Whether it is with BMAX or no BMAX, the Rock Hall housing development will be built. The people of Castries East and all St. Lucians deserve better housing. Mr. Speaker, we believe that it is important that you know how the monies earned from the CIP 
have been used. I cannot explain how monies were used under the previous government, as we do not know how monies were used. No one in here can remember a single project that was ever funded by the CIP under the previous administration. Not one. I will leave it to the leader of the opposition to provide such information to the Honorable House how he spent the CIP millions that he had. Since July 2021, a total of $146.8 million have been transferred to the National Economic Fund. Let me repeat it, Mr. Speaker. And I want the Leader of the Opposition to make his notes because he has a way of accusing and saying things. $146.8 million has been transferred to the National Economic Fund. Of that amount, $75 million has been transferred to the Consolidated Fund and used primarily for debt repayments. From excess operating cash earned by the unit, $54.1 million has been spent supporting the work of various agencies and programs. I shall categorize and highlight as follows. Agricultural support, $2.2 million. Included is the construction of the Miku jetty and support for banana farmers affected by the delay in supply of packaging material. Number two, national security and citizen safety. $2.8 million included is support for RSS officers, vehicles for the police, and for supplying the bodily correctional facilities with equipment. Number three, constituency development. 3.4 million used for supporting the constituency development program in housing and small projects. Four, culture and creative support. 4.2 million used for carnival and festival expenses. Five, educational support. Five million dollars, notably for back to school support and other school support. Six, energy support. 1.2 million used to subsidize the price of fuel and LNG. Seven, for food subsidy, $4.3 million used to subsidize food prices and provide food vouchers. Eight, health services, $13.3 million to meet liabilities of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex and outstanding COVID-19 bills. Nine, national infrastructural improvement, $3.8 million used to improve the national road network. Ten, National Emergency Response, 800,000 for flood relief victims. 11, social development projects, 8.4 million used for various social development programs, projects, and other small infrastructural projects. 12, sports, 1.5 million. 13, community tourism, 1.6 million used for additional works at the Ancillary Waterfront Project. Mr. Speaker, I hope the above provides a fairly comprehensive account of monies that has been spent by the government from monies earned from the CIP since July 2021. I have not accounted for the expenditure of the National Economic Fund as it has been audited, nor monies held in trust at the National Economic Fund and CIP unit awaiting transfer. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude by again reflecting on the extraordinary, vicious attack on the CIP and the citizens of St. Lucia. It is not a critic of policy, decision-making, or operations. It has been personal, malicious, untrue, unpatriotic, and destabilizing. It has known no bonds. But what is interesting is that this attack has been fed from information from Martinez and Rejok. Martinez has said a lot and promised a lot, and soon the courts will decide. It was clear that Martinez wanted to destroy the CIP for his own purposes. He found a willing ally in the member for Miku South, who shows no loyalty to St. Lucia or St. Lucians. I am confident that the RICO case will be exposed as a sham, and all accomplices will have to account. Mr. Speaker, the UWPs have taken comfort in the writings of Kenneth Rejok, who describes himself 
as a convicted money launderer. But it's important that you remember the writings of Rijok in relation to the member for Miku South. What Rijok wrote about the member for Miku South. Writings that have since de been deleted from his online blog. Luckily, they can still be found. Let me take you back to one of his articles about the leader of the opposition, dated March 21st, 2021, title, St. Lucia's Prime Minister's Criminal Conduct Justifies His Removal and Arrest. That was the title of the article. St. Lucia's Prime Minister, it was March 2021. St. Lucia's Prime Minister Just one second. Technology is failing me there. Criminal misconduct justifies his removal and arrest and he was to, to the then former Prime Minister. Rejok describes and stated that the then Prime Minister, now opposition member for Miku South, and I quote, and I want you to listen carefully, Alan Shasi's administration operates on a plan similar of a former administration in the United States where every cabinet official is for sale if the price is right. Rijok went on to say, and I quote, Alan Chastney is comparable to the conman and pathological liar type and bluster. And that, and I quote again, after years that Chastney has remained in office, crime and corruption are still the order of the day. That's what Kenneth Rejok wrote about him. Maybe, maybe the leader of the opposition should offer an explanation for the statement made, the statement made in that article. If he can justify his actions and level accusations on the basis of what Rejok writes, then how comes how does he account for what Rijok said about him? Because he's quoting Rijok, he's quoting Martinez, but this is what Rijok said about him. How does he explain it? Mr. Speaker, I end by giving the assurance to the people of St. Lucia that our CIP is in safe hands. Since the signing of the memorandum of agreement between the countries in the region offering CIP, a regional regulatory body has been established. We welcome this as it will make all the programs more transparent and accountable. We have also engaged an auditor, Deloitte, to undertake an audit of the CIP, which will review our operations and make recommendations where necessary. The new pricing structure introduced by the MOA has affected the structure of investments. We are presently in discussions with Galaxy, potential investors, and our legal counsel to ensure that the most robust and compliant structure for these investments. Mr. Speaker, I can inform the Honorable House that since July 1st, all infrastructure sales as well as potential new investments for real estate and infrastructure have been suspended. Since July 1st, have been suspended. We are hoping that very shortly we will resume sales and all our normal activities. We will be stronger and better. The CIP is a major source of revenue and offers the possibility to finance our national development in a significant way. It is why the UWPs are relentless to destroy it. They see their doom in its success. They have created a false narrative about corruption and scandal. They have joined with two ex-cons who attack the program, the Prime Minister and myself, and even persons who are not political. But it is not about myself or the Prime Minister. It is about our country, our people, our development, our dreams and our aspirations. No one who wants to lead this country should do so on a foundation of manufactured lies and deceit. We will overcome Martinez, rejoke, and when the time comes, you, the people of Senusha, 
will answer the leader of the opposition in a louder voice than you did on July 26, 2021. I thank you.